We are coming into the last two weeks of our series on the case for truth, and I'm grateful for Dr. Wave Nunley, who's been helping me in previous weeks, and I'm going to, because of my own educational background, I guess, I'm going to be tackling uh, these, these last two Sundays, which are a two-part series entitled, Can I Believe in the Bible and in Science? You know the joke around here, if you've been around for a while, is that your pastor is a rocket scientist, and that is true. I studied nine years uh, studying aerospace engineering, and um, I, I love science. I read physics books on vacation, and I, I, just, I just am inspired by this. It's not right, but I'm inspired, <laughs> except I believe the Lord's our creator, and it just, the heavens declare the glory of God, and I just feel like I'm worshiping the Lord when I'm f- trying to learn how He made everything work. It's amazing. But also, I'm very troubled by the fact that right now, that reason, that one of the top five reasons of choice that millennials are dropping out of church and leaving biblical faith is because science is supposedly making it impossible for them to believe in the Bible. And out there in our culture, especially with the, with the aggressiveness of the new atheists the last 20 years, I grew up hearing that faith in science might be incompatible. But now we're hearing they are flat-out enemies of one another. And, and that has never been my experience in all my own scientific training. And so I, I want to just dive into this with you. And if you've ever done research, if you are involved. Now, if you, don't, if, if you dread math, fear not. I, I mainly got a lot of pictures this morning. <laughs> but if you've ever been involved in research or scientific investigation of any kind, you get these verses. You will get these verses, because I felt exactly this way out of Proverbs chapter 8. Here, wisdom is being personified, and in verse 27 of Proverbs 8, I, wisdom, was there when he, God, set the heavens in place, and when he marked out the horizons on the face of the deep. So I'm watching God's creative genius. Verse 30, wisdom says, then I was constantly at his side, I was filled with delight day after day, rejoicing always in his presence, rejoicing in his whole world, and delighting in mankind. So this idea of just that delight of physics books, this delight of discovering how things can work, possibly if you've had a background in the sciences, you know something about that. But because I've been a runner a lot of my life and because of my education, Um, I also delight in the t-shirts that people give me. So I thought this would be the Sunday to show you some of them. Now, you know how people always say, you know, it's not rocket science. Not rocket science. So I like this one. It says, it's not rocket science. It's aerospace engineering. (laughs) And and that is technically true. My, uh, my, My three degrees are specifically in aerospace engineering. But then sometimes, because I'm a little klutzy, people will say to me, Pastor, it's not rocket science. And so this is a handy T-shirt. Actually, I am a rocket scientist. <laughs> really handy. Now, here's a, here's a T-shirt, honestly, I've never worn. And I probably never will, and you'll have to forgive me for it. But I just think it's incredibly funny. The universe is made of protons, neutrons, electrons, and morons. <laughs> No comment. And then I love this one. Someone in the church gave me this one. Pi without an E. That's the Greek symbol for pi. Pi is the most fascinating number. It naturally recurs in the universe. It's actually approximately 22 divided by 7. And you, it's 3.14 and goes on and on and on, the decimals. And it, pi... You know, but one famous mathematician once said, one of the reasons I believe in God is that mathematics works. You know, Einstein said, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. It's amazing how mathematics works. So you take pi, 22 divided by 7 roughly, and you multiply it by the diameter of a circle, and bingo, you get how far around that circle is. Or if you take pi and multiply it by the diameter, 
and then multiply it by the diameter of that circle one more time, and then divide the whole thing by four, and you get the area inside this, this circle. I mean, how does that even work? So I love, I love my pie t-shirt, hallelujah. I like the pie with an E, too. But, and then this one, one of my faves. Have you ever, um, before I show it to you, have you ever had to say to a rather persistent person, what is it about no that you don't understand? <laughs> have you had to say that? Right. Well, this is, we got this at the Johnson Space Center. Just what part of, and then a whole list of orbital and thrust equations, do you not understand? <laughs> we rocket scientists love to ask that question. What is it about that you don't understand? Well, I have a lot of fun with science, and it doesn't threaten my faith whatsoever. In fact, one of the most famous science and faith verses in the New Testament is Romans 1, verse 20, when it comes to what is it you don't understand. He says there's a lot of understandable things because of what we observe in the universe. And specifically, we understand the nature of God. Verse 20 of Romans 1, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, which are His eternal power and His divine nature, His power and nature become understandable through the general revelation of what we see, being understood from what has been made so that we're really without excuse. And so it's important that we look at, first of all, what is science telling us right now? that could indicate something that's knowable about God's divine power and God's divine, eternal power and His divine nature. What is it that science is telling us? And I do want to, just towards the end, also talk about what science is not telling us. So here we go. I'm going to borrow an outline that I heard given by Dr. Stephen Meyer when he preached right here at Central a number of years ago. I was not the pastor here at the time. I was sitting right over there half, uh, about a third of the way up on that side balcony. I was taking notes as he was, as he was, gave this brilliant message and, 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 and how he summarized what science is saying to us in the three great realms of study in science. I thought this is one of the most brilliant, concise descriptions I've ever heard. And and he has just now come out. In fact, I got my copy of the book last week. He's just come out, Dr. Stephen Meyer, with a brand new book entitled The Return of the God Hypothesis, in which he deals with these things science is telling us and, 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 the push, and he deals with the pushback to some of his arguments and how that, that this is pretty convincing what science is telling us now about God's eternal power and divine nature. And so I thought I'd borrow his outline. If you were a part of this on Wednesday night a couple of years ago, this will be a little bit review. But I love this because it's the sort of thing you can easily remember. And, and, and if you're sharing faith with non-Christians, eventually somebody's going to say, yeah, but science just makes it impossible for me to believe the Bible. And, and this might be one way that's easy, memorable, but I think comprehensive in responding so he starts, first of all, with the field of cosmology. And what cosmology is telling us right now in the scientific world is that the universe has a beginning. Now, this is not cosmetology. That's another science. <laughs> but this is, ology means study, right? So it's a study of the cosmos, the universe. And it's telling us that the universe has a beginning. And our universe is absolutely amazing. So I want to show you some pictures uh, of our universe courtesy of one of the members of Central Assembly. He's sitting right down there, Richard Hammer, my good friend, and his wife, Chris, and uh, Richard's head legal counsel for the Sons of the God headquarters next door. So he's sort of an attorney by day and an astronomer by night. He also teaches astronomy classes at Evangel University, and he takes pictures astronomically that even NASA is publishing, and uh, Rich, we're indebted to you for these. There, there he is with his telescopes in his uh, driveway, and it's amazing. And the, uh, I'm going to show you a few more next week, but, but he sent me a few this past week, like Omega Centauri. This is a globular star cluster in our galaxy. That's an amazing picture, Rich. Um, 
This is a part of our galaxy where stars are much closer together than in our neighborhood of the galaxy. And uh, this, this is, this, that, that globular star cluster in our galaxy probably has millions of stars in it. It's a beautiful picture. Um, there are just literally billions and billions of stars total in the Milky Way galaxy. And I believe that took, um, I believe that, that, that just is just a brilliant, this is 10 times larger than any other globular star cluster in our galaxy. The next one is a picture Rich took of the Pinwheel Galaxy, which is outside. This is another galaxy outside of our galaxy, the Milky Way. Isn't that a gorgeous picture? Took Rich 10 hours of exposure to take that. And you've got to accommodate for the rotation of the Earth and all kinds of things. And that, that Rich, is an amazing picture. Billions more stars in that. And uh, it's actually one of the closer. It's in our galaxy neighborhood in the universe. Um, the speed of light, right? Your car goes 60 miles per hour or 60 miles every hour. Light goes 186,000 miles every second. That's blazing fast. So to get to one of these near, nearby galaxies, it would take you 2.6 million years to get there. And that's a pretty close galaxy to us. Not the closest, but close. It's amazing. And then the Sculptor Galaxy, the next picture, this beautiful galaxy that Rich photographed. This is the Sculptor Galaxy. At the speed of light, it would take you 11.4 million, uh, million years to get to this one. But it's just a beautiful galaxy. Now, we're going to keep that picture up for a few minutes because 100 years ago, scientists believed a couple of things. Number one, there were no other galaxies in the universe except ours, the Milky Way. And they also believe that the universe has already been, always been here, call it the steady state uh, nature of the universe. Therefore, there was no beginning to the universe. However, the very famous astronomer, Edwin Hubble, um, 100 years ago, he was looking through his telescopes, and first of all, he realized there are other galaxies out there. We're not the only galaxy. And then he realized that these galaxies are moving away from us, and literally the farther away they are from us, the faster they're going. In other words, that's a fancy way of saying the universe is actually expanding, which means it had a starting point. At the same time, 100 years ago, Einstein was developing his general theory of relativity, and to his shock and dismay, because he did not want anything that had a God implication in his science, he, he, he realized that, that his own theories, uh, equations for relativity require, uh, spoke of an expanding universe and required a starting point. And he became familiar with what Hubble was doing. He saw these red shifts Hubble did in the, in the light spectrum and galaxies going away. And, and, and yet, for years, Einstein did not want to accept the fact, in spite of Hubble's work, in spite of his own ongoing research with his own equations and other things, he actually tried to change his equations to take away the starting point. That's not exactly following the science. That's letting worldview cover everything, just like is happening, by the way, in the materialistic science world right now. Worldview is almost more definitive than research. And so he, he uh, finally Einstein caved in after several years and reluctantly admitted famously the universe has a beginning. And so this is, this is where the scientific world's come the last hundred years. The scientific world has come all the way to at least the first three words of the Bible in the beginning, in the beginning. We have another field of science, physics. This is more what I studied, physics. And thank you, Rich. You can go to seetheglory.com, free ad, free commercial for Rich. Seetheglory.com and see a lot more of these pictures. Rich, take a, take a stand. Take a bow, Rich. We're, we're grateful for you. Awesome. In physics... We're learning not only the universe had a beginning, but that the laws of nature are finely tuned. They're very specific to the degree that it seems it's highly improbable that it could have happened by accident. This is why, to get around this, we talk about 
multiverses. Like, well, there's an infinite number of universes, so we got to get it right with all the fine-tuning at least once if there's an infinite number. And because we're here, it must have happened. That's what scientists, you hear them say a lot now. But the fact is, you still need fine-tuning with the universe generating mechanisms and certain boundary conditions. And so you still come back to the same question. How, how did this happen by, by chance? Probably the most famous scientist in America today is, is Dr. Francis Collins. He today oversees the National Institute of Health. He is himself a geneticist, and he and his team were the first ever in human history to sequence the human genome, which was a staggering scientific accomplishment. And Dr. Collins, as an adult scientist, has an amazingly inspiring story of how he came to faith personally in Jesus Christ. And he writes, when you look from the perspective of a scientist at the universe, it looks as if it knew we were coming. There are 15 constants, the gravitational constant, various constants about the strong and weak nuclear force, etc. And they all, those physical constants, all have very precise values. And if, if any one of those constants was off by even one point in a million, or in some cases, one part in a million million, matter would not have been able to coalesce, and there would have been no galaxies, stars, planets, or people. In other words, this universe is pretty finely tuned. Everything's got to be perfect for us to be here. Or my friend, uh, Pastor Craig Kruger of Sojourn Campus Church, that's the church that I helped to start out of my years uh, at the University of Minnesota, also involved in student ministry. And Craig was a math major back then, and now he's the pastor of the church. He writes, now it is true that 40 billion planets in the Milky Way may have sufficient liquid water to support biological life as we know it. But what of the other necessary zones for life as we know it to exist? Like, like take, take just one of them, the photosynthetic zone as an example. Remember in high school, high school science, you study photosynthesis, right? The light and the leaves. And he says, without photosynthesis, only microbes can exist. No plants or animals can survive. But for photosynthesis to occur, seven factors must be fine-tuned. Seven factors must be fine-tuned. Light intensity, ambient temperature, carbon dioxide concentration, regularly occurring seasonal variation, mineral availability, liquid water supply, and for land-based life, atmospheric community. These seven factors alone eliminate all the known star planet systems for hab habitability in our galaxy, except for our Sun-Earth system. And then there's six other zones that have to line up absolutely precisely on top of that. In the very first message in this series, I referenced an article, and I thought I'd actually put it in front of you. And in the written notes out in the lobby, you can pick up, you, you'll see it written there. Mark Pinsky, USA Today, while a journalist, while impossible to quantify, a surprising number of prominent British researchers in the pinnacle of their fields with worldwide reputations in the physical and biological sciences proclaim their evangelical Christian faith, sometimes at risk to their careers. And, and he answers why. First, they say the likelihood that intelligent carbon-based life originated in the universe by chance is infinitesimally minute. That's the fine-tuning that this could have happened by chance. And second, they proclaim, and this is what Dr. Nunley's been talking to us about the last few weeks, and second, they proclaim their belief in what they accept as the firsthand biblical accounts of Jesus' life, death, and physical resurrection. So cosmology is telling us the universe had a beginning. Physics is telling us that the laws of nature, the universe itself, is finely tuned but there's one other big field of scientific study that's biology, biology. And, and this, this is of a special interest to scientists right now because we're finding that life is coded with information. And the question is, where did information come from? You've got matter, you've got energy, 
But where did information come from? Like you've got your computer, that's matter. You've got electricity to run it, that's energy. But where, where did the software programming come from? It seems to require an intelligence of some kind, information. So, this first picture. You see, you've been complaining to me. You've been saying, Pastor, your, your grandson was here two weeks ago, and we haven't even seen a picture yet, so there you go. That's the little Paxton James Sebastian, our little, we love that little kid. He's a heart stealer. But in his little body right there are billions and billions of cells. And in every one of those billions and billions of cells is the longest word in the universe. It is at least three billion with a B letters long. It's combinations of four chemical letters which scientists just call C, G, A, and T. And it's his genome. It's his DNA. Now, he looks a little like his dad. He looks like a little like his mother. And I hope he'll grow up looking a little like his grandma, Sandy. But, but he, he's got, he's programmed with unbelievable information that's guiding. He's there, he's about half a year, but guiding his formation and his, and his development. It was discovered in the 1950s by Crick and Watson. It's the double helix DNA. There is a beautiful pic, uh, diagram of it on the left. On the right-hand side, you take and, and just flatten it out and take out the curve, and, and you see it looks like a ladder, doesn't it? And those little rungs on the ladder are called nucleotides, and they, they're made up of the combination of C, G, A, and T chemical letters. And, uh, and that goes on, like, like three, three and a half billion of those letters. And it's programmed information. Like, like life is coded with information. And then those strands of DNA are woven all together in each one of, for an adult, the trillions of cells we have into 23 pairs of chromosomes. I mean, I just hold that little guy in my, in my arms and I go, life is so unbelievably incredible. How can this be? And here, here are the words of John Lennox, who's an Oxford mathematician, world famous, and a philosopher. And he writes this, in recent years, information has come to be regarded as one of the fundamental concepts of science, more than mass and energy, but information. And one of the most intriguing things about information is that it is, that it is not physical. Now, this information you're reading at the moment is carried on the physical medium of paper and ink or a, or, or, or a screen. But the information itself is not material. As I argue in detail elsewhere, the non-materiality of information points to a non-material source, a mind. And could it be the mind of God? So, in summary, I want to put up those three statements in front of you. The universe had a has a beginning. The laws of nature are finely tuned. And life is coded with information. Now, I want to ask you, do any of those statements take away from biblical faith? Do any of those statements threaten your faith? Do any of those statements that, that science is telling us say, oh, because of those statements, I can't believe the Bible? No, in fact, the opposite. And you'll never hear it in the media, but more and more scientists are starting to realize, you know, this is it. I had a friend who worked at Fermi Labs in Chicago where they're not doing the technology of today they're doing the science today that will be the technology of 20 years from now. He said, he said, back in the 1980s and 90s, there was this arrogance in the scientific community that we could figure out TOE, T-O-E, the theory of everything. And science would tell us it all. And, and he said, but he said, something started to shift the more we started understanding some of these things. 
He said, and I'd sit in these briefings every morning from scientific data that came in from researchers all over the world overnight. And, and he said, it was interesting over time. They just start, that arrogance started giving away to a, to a humility. I actually could hear scientists in the room whisper, that looks like God. And this brings us, none of this stuff, none of this stuff threatens our faith. It, it leads us to, to a Bible that teaches us the universe did have a beginning and it was created and fine-tuned and there was an intelligent mind that coded this world with information. That This all makes perfect sense and, and it's, it, it is under the surface actually growing these days in the scientific world. And they say, well, don't most, aren't most scientists atheists? No, actually, actually, two-thirds of Nobel science winners over the last years have actually believed in God. And, and the percentage of scientists is not that much different than the percentage of the population that believes. And, and, and I already told you about scientists that have come to, come to Christ as scientists. I mean, this stuff doesn't take away biblical faith. In fact... Under, under the surface, the opposite's happening. But let me just close with what science is not telling us. One of the most important equations in science is the Schrodinger wave equation, which is used a lot in quantum theory. And Erwin Schrodinger wrote this, I am very astonished that the scientific picture of the real world around me is very deficient. It carries a lot of factual information. It puts all of our experience in a magnificently consistent order. But it is ghastly silent about all that's really near to our heart that really matters to us. It, it, it knows nothing of beauty and ugly, good or bad, God and eternity. And science sometimes pretends to answer questions in these domains but the answers are often so silly that we are not inclined to take them seriously. Materialistic science, of course, will reduce you totally to chemical reactions that are totally ran random. It will strip personhood from you. And every culture that's adopted blatant atheistic materialism has always gone that direction of dehumanizing spirit, human life. Because it can't answer. Can't answer questions. I, I just put, put four, although I could have given you 40. Questions like, what makes us uniquely human? And is our soul and spirit more than our physical brain? And where does moral authority come from? And, and how can meaning even exist? I mean, science does not have the answers to those questions. But here's what the Apostle John, in the first verse of the fourth book of the New Testament, the Gospel of John. Here's what he put. He put this. In the beginning was the Word. I'm fascinated by the fact, first of all, he borrows the first three verses of the beginning of the Bible, in the beginning. But he doesn't say, in the beginning was mass and energy. No. He said, in the beginning was, get this, information, word, in the Greek, logos, that, that totality of what we could know and understand. And everything that God wanted us to know about himself as the creator. In the beginning was something spoken to us. It was the word. And it turns out he's talking about Jesus. And the word was with God. And the word was God. He was with God in the beginning and get this, through him all things were made. We're going to look at Genesis 1 next week and look at creation. He's saying when God spoke and said, let there be light, that word, Jesus, was himself eternally with God, equal to God. He was himself the active agent of creation. And uh, without him, nothing was made that has been made. But then to pick up where science leaves off not able to answer the truly important questions for the average human being. John goes on to say, and in him was life. And that life was the 
in an information world. The light, the light of all mankind. And then stunningly, he says 10 verses later in verse 14, and the word became flesh. I don't even know what to do with that, except to say you, there's nothing like this anywhere. In the beginning was God's information that he coded all of life with, including you and me and my grandson. The creator who had a beginning to the universe and finely tuned it. All of these things we now know from science that, that just suddenly find all of their culmination in that simple little phrase, the word became flesh. To meet you and me where we are. I'd like you to just bow your head and close your eyes with me just for a moment. I'd like to pray for you. And as I do, I realize that some of you, and I pray, God, don't let me sound preachy today. This is science. I love science. I don't want to sound pushy about this if you're really still skeptical. If you've really bought into the materialistic worldview um, and you're still holding on, <laughs> here's going to be my prayer for you that at least today you'll, you'll dare to shut the door on the deification of science and science having the last word on everything. I mean, when I became a researcher working with sciences, I was shocked how we, researchers could take one piece of data and interpret it in different ways and then get angry with each other. I mean, politicized data, that's about what we need right now. But you know what? Um, science is not the end all of everything. And a lot of scientists don't even agree. But I'd like to just to be willing to close the door on the possibility that science is the last word. And just open the door to the possibility that in the beginning was the word. And something that integrates everything in life and makes it all fall into place with light and life and hope that our humanity can be truly realized when we come again to know, first of all, there was a creator and that we can have a relationship with him. So, Father, here we are. We just say yes to your grace. But maybe some of us are actually willing to just say, Lord, forgive me. I'm going to give you a chance. Just forgive my sin. Just come into my life. And others of us, if we're not there, we just pray that you will be, help us to be intellectually and spiritually honest enough to close the door on the idea that science is the be-all and end-all and that there might be things that science can't address that you want to reveal to us and that we could have a relationship with you. Help us not to, just to close the door and walk out of here and never, and never be open, Lord, to what you might be speaking to us and saying to us. And if we're ready, we say yes to you, Lord. Forgive our sin, come into our lives. And Lord, all of us, we say thank you. Thank you for what you have done. Hallelujah. We honor you and praise you in Jesus' name.